Okay, so this is going to be instead of our last class, I would like for you to watch this um, video about what we would have talked about in class, because like, I think it's just a really important topic to kind of end the semester on. So this will be about genetics, history, and the American eugenics movement. It is adapted from PBS. And so the first thing you'll do is go onto campus and watch that YouTube video um, walking through the history of the American eugenics movement. So we want to be able to understand the role that society played in promoting ideas of the eugenics leaders, analyze why the eugenics movement took place in the United States, talk about the ethical implications of some current things, become aware of organizations and laws that are now in place, and think about the future. So um, why is learning about the American eugenics movement useful? Well, it helps us to understand our past, who was impacted, what were the effects, as well as the present and the future. And for the present and future, I'm going to leave a lot of that up to your presentations that you're working on with your groups, because a lot of those kind of overlap with each other. And instead, we will be focusing on the past here. What was the American eugenics movement and who is really impacted by that? So um, what are the new health and medical and ethical advances? Again, you're going to cover this in some of your groups, genetic screening and genetic engineering. I'm going to skip through some of this um, about gene therapy. Again, group presentations are going to explore several of these questions. So what was the American eugenics movement and who was impacted? We're going to go through eugenic ideology and the legal implementation. The American eugenics movement began in the early 20th century. The main goal was to improve society and reduce the burden of people who some consider to be inferior. That is, just as screening for intelligence and other, quote, desirable traits would be acceptable to some people today, it was similarly acceptable in past decades. The late 19th and early 20th centuries brought an enormous amount of change to the United States. The nation began to shift from an agrarian to an industrial economy and society. Millions of immigrants arrived and cities grew at an exponential rate. These changes created social challenges, including increased poverty, slums, disease, child labor. Eugenicists believed that immigrants from Southern Europe were genetically inferior, as were people living in poverty i.e. they were poor because they were genetically designed to be lazy and poor. Although incorrect, eugenicists believe that preventing poor people and immigrants from reproducing, thereby reducing the population of genetically inferior individuals, would solve societal problems. Despite many scientists' skepticism and outright rejection, some people began defining different levels of intelligence through the use of specific tests. It was around this time that the IQ test was created, and this illustration shows how people were categorized by their mental age that eugenicists believed they would reach, and the type of work eugenicists believed they would be able to perform. Part of the goal of eugenicists was to show that genetically inferior people will become a burden to society. Various states and organizations then promoted positive eugenics by encouraging people who were deemed superior to have as many children as possible. The first Fitter Family Contest, which was based on Better Babies contests, was held at the Kansas State Fair in 1920. Both types of contests took a deterministic view of genetics and biology and assumed that there were genes, good genes for characteristics like honesty, morality, and industriousness that could be passed on to children. The Red Cross originally sponsored these competitions. Families were judged in, category, in categories that included the size of their family, their attractiveness, their health, their generosity of spirit, etc. Many state laws have forbid interracial marriage from the late 17th century all the way until 1967, when the Supreme Court ruled in Loving versus Virginia that such laws were unconstitutional. Eugenic ideas lent a new set of justification for such laws by providing a pseudoscientific explanation for the perils of quote unquote race mixing. For a more detailed explanation, you can read uh, the pieces by legal historian Paul Lombardo. Surgical sterilization, a procedure that prevents a person from reproducing and having children, was a key tool of the eugenics programs throughout the United States. 
Sterilization techniques include a hysterectomy, tubal ligation, and vasectomy. Four sterilization programs were underway in many places by 1937, including Puerto Rico and other U.S. territories. Under Law 116, one-third of women in their 20s were sterilized in Puerto Rico, according to a report from the United States Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. As such, the impact of this law persisted for generations. While overpopulation was cited as the reason for widespread poverty on the island, and therefore the justification for sterilization, historians argue that the history of colonialization and the sugar industry better explain the poverty. Additionally, Puerto Rico was without full constitutional rights until 1947 and did not have a democratically elected governor until 1948. Law 116 remained in effect in Puerto Rico until 1960. Eugenicists used the US legal system to create a pathway for programs where people could be sterilized by local and state public health figures. Harry Buck was born in 1906 to a poor mo mother who was eventually committed to the Virginia State Colony for epileptics and the feeble-minded. Carrie was then placed in foster care, and at 17, she became pregnant as the result of being raped, most likely by a nephew of her foster parents. Her foster parents then committed her to the Virginia State Colony on the grounds of feeble-mindedness and promiscuity. In 1927, Carrie was the plaintiff in the Supreme Court case Buck v. Bell, which established that the state does have a right to sterilize someone without their consent. Carrie was sterilized to pre prevent passing along her, quote, feeble-mindedness, which she, her mother, and her daughter were all declared to exhibit. In 1927, the 8 to ruling in Buck versus Bell established the right of the state to sterilize people who were deemed unfit. Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, writing an opinion that represented the majority of the justices, argued that the interest of the state to improve the gene pool superseded that of an individual's right to maintain bodily integrity. He wrote, oh, sorry, he wrote that society can prevent those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their kinds. Three generations of imbeciles are enough. Pedigrees were an important tool that eugenists used to trace the pattern of inheritance in a family. So this slide shows a pedigree from a woman who was sterilized by the state of Maine. Eugenicists scored her family members and traced the lineage of defective as well as superior individuals. Pedigrees trace traits such as immoral behavior, criminality, disease, intelligence, and feeble-mindedness. While there is essentially no scientific basis for the inheritance of any of these characteristics, the creation of these pedigrees based on these characteristics nevertheless helped establish them as a legitimate science. This slide shows a quote from Adolf Hitler in 1931, recalled in the memoirs of former Nazi general and Hitler's economic advisor, Otto Wagner. This quote was one of several instances recorded in Hitler's conversations and writings in which he claimed to have learned from the American eugenics policies. The slide also includes an excerpt from the 1934 editorial in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is one of the most prominent and prestigious medical publications in the United States, which, com which commended the sterilization program implemented by Nazi Germany. German scientists and eugenicists were greatly influenced by the work of prominent American scientists, and the two groups exchanged papers and visited one another's labs and offices. The United States passed its first law allowing sterilization in 1907, 26 years before Germany passed theirs. The Rockefellers, who were oil and banking magnates, used their family wealth through their foundation to help support the German eugenics program. They funded the program where Joseph, Joseph Mengel worked before he became the physician at Auschwitz, for which he is known as the Angel of Death. After a 1934 visit to Germany where over 5,000 people were being sterilized each month, California eugenics leader stated to a colleague, quote, you'll be interested to know that your work has played a powerful part in shaping the opinions of the group of intellectuals who are behind Hitler in this program. Everywhere I sensed that their opinions have been tremendously stimulated by American thought. I want you, my dear friend, to carry this thought with you for the rest of your life, that you have really jolted into action a great government of 60 million people. The Nuremberg Code was established in 1947 as a result of the doctor's trials, which was intended to bring justice to the victims of medical experimentation in Nazi Germany. 
Among the lengthy list of crimes that were prosecuted in the trials were the Nazis' efforts to develop mass sterilization techniques that could be performed without the victims being aware of it, including exposing them to dangerous x-rays. The Nuremberg Code sought to prevent such atrocities from happening again by establishing protections around voluntary consent and safety in medicine and research. One of the core protections of the Nuremberg Code is the informed consent of willing participants. These codes have guided the development of many medical and research studies with positive outcomes, including successful clinical trials and drug developments. However, the Nuremberg Code is not a cure-all. It did not halt unethical practices in the United States and forced sterilizations. By World War II, many scientists in the U.S. had largely rejected earlier scientific theories that had provided the justification for the eugenics movement, but many of these ideas about who was and was not fit to reproduce had already taken root in state governments. With the weight of the U.S. legal system behind the practice, sterilization continued. In many cases, forced sterilization came to a halt through activism of groups being targeted themselves. So this pamphlet, which was aimed to persuade the public about the merits of sterilization, was published by an organization called the Human Betterment League of North Carolina. James Haynes, founder of the organization and of Haynes Clothing and Hosiery Company in 1947. The goal of the organization was to promote the sterilization of those deemed unfit. North Carolina had an aggressive state-run push to sterilize people. Initially, 85% of those sterilized were women and girls. In the 1960s, the sterilization of men largely ended, at which point 99% were women and girls. Many were rape victims who were deemed promiscuous. Others were considered intellectually inferior and classified as morons, idiots, or feeble-minded. People with mental illness, as well as physical illness like epilepsy, were also sterilized. According to the task force, established in 2011 by the North Carolina governor, 2,990 of the almost 7,600 sterilizations that North Carolina performed were performed on people between the ages of 10 and 18. The total number of 7,600 includes only those operations directed by the state board and not those performed locally, which were likely not reported. Indigenous people were specifically targeted for sterilization as part of a longer history of mistreatment and erasure of indigenous people in the United States. This image produced by the US Department of Health, Education and Welfare in 1974 sought to link sterilization with an increase in wealth and happiness. The image depicts a large family of, with parents who are unhappy and less wealthy. In 1976, the U.S. government accounting office released its finding that 3,406 sterilizations were performed at Indian health service centers between 1973 and 1976. Given the number of stories they and other community members have heard about indigenous women being forcefully sterilized, Dr. Pinkerton and Maria Sanchez each decided to conduct their own research. Through their efforts to document the experiences of many indigenous people, they found significant differences with the number of procedures that were recorded. As a result, some researchers believe that the number of women who were sterilized is much, much higher than has been reported. Adding to the trauma of these events is the evidence that many of the sterilizations were often done without consent. Okay, so looking towards the future, how can we access the benefits and reduce the harm in genetics? Protests against forced sterilizations took place around the nation during the 1970s, including the one in North Carolina depicted on this slide. Though many individuals opposed the practice from the start, protests against forced sterilizations grew out of the civil rights and women's movements. Many states like California outlawed the practice in the mid to late 1970s. Though the Buck versus Bell Supreme Court decision allowing the practice has never been overturned, Many cases at the state level reject these ideas. People continue to protest federal sterilization laws in court, as illustrated in the slide about the 1978 case Madrigal versus Quiglin. Madrigal versus Quiglin is with a federal class action suit against the doctors in Los Angeles County Hospital brought by 10 women who were forcefully sterilized without their consent. The case was inspired by women talking with one another and coming forward, and more broadly by the Chicano movement that sought rights and fair treatment for Mexican migrants, among others. 
While the judge decided in favor of the defendants, the case was key in revising the way in which informed consent was carried out in the medical industry. Under the lawsuit, consent forms were only in English, and consent was often sought during active labor and with threats of withholding everything from pain medicine to future welfare benefits. Additionally, rules such as waiting periods for decisions about sterilization after birth were implemented. Elaine Riddick has been an outspoken survivor of North Carolina's forced sterilization program. She was born into poverty and raised by her grandmother. At the age of 13, she was raped by a man in her neighborhood and became pregnant. She gave birth in March of 1968 and was sterilized immediately afterwards without her knowledge or consent. Her grandmother, who was illiterate, signed the consent form out of fear that Elaine would be sent to an orphanage if she refused. Elaine did not discover what had happened with her until she was married and tried to conceive a child. In 2011, the governor of North Carolina established a commission to determine how much to compensate Elaine and the estimated 2,000 other living victims of sterilization. There was much debate about whether any amount of money could compensate for not only the loss of her fertility, but also for branding victims as promiscuous and feeble-minded. North Carolina became the first state in the United States to approve payments to victims of its eugenic sterilization program in 2013, after 10 years of debate. The state officially sterilized at least 7,600 people, According to the February 2018 article in the Winston-Salem Journal, reparations of $50,000, $50,454 were paid to 220 victims in three installments. The only other state that has paid compensation is Virginia, which has awarded its victims $25,000. Sterilization continues to make headlines in recent years, often as it relates to incarcerated people in the criminal sentencing. Investigative reporting revealed in 2014 that from 2006 to 2010, 112 inmates in California prisons were sterilized without their consent. These sterilizations were categorized by unsigned consent forms, falsified documents, and women stating that they had been coerced. Much of the sterilization programs were propelled forward through racism and promises of economic relief and stability. One of the doctors involved in a large percentage noted to a reporter on the subject of economic sterilization that the cost of sterilization that were small compared, quote, to what you save in welfare for those children. New laws were passed as a result to better protect inmates. In 2018, a woman awaiting sentencing underwent sterilization after the judge suggested that this could favorably impact how long she was incarcerated. Many argue that this was coercive, as the pressures of a possible shorter sentence make true informed consent impossible. NIH protections for human research continue to adapt to the changing field. In addition to state-level action, the United States government works to ensure the progress in science, research, and technology proceeds at an ethical and socially acceptable manner, so as not to see echoes of the past repeated. Okay. So again, please watch the videos posted to Canvas and watch this full video, um, and the slides are also available.